and winning the ranch again, of course, that's not real profitable at the time because of drought and stuff. So I did that for a number of years. Then I came back and applied at Dakota Plains Legal Services in Pine Ridge. I worked there for a couple of years. And then uh, there was an opening for a judge in Kyle at the time. And I interviewed for that and was the associate judge in Kyle. Handled all cases, juvenile protection orders, uh, criminal court, uh, letters of administration, probate, uh, you name it, uh, I worked on it. After spending time at Kyle, I applied to be a judge at Rosebud. And I was a judge at Rosebud for a little over four years. And then the opportunity arose to become a chief judge and court administrator for the Crow Creek Sea Tribe. And I helped administrate the court, run the budgets, make sure all the bills were paid, and that the court ran smoothly. And then came the big job. After four tries, I finally interviewed with Governor Dugard. I was happy being the judge and didn't want to switch, but he was relentless. So I became the Secretary of Tribal Relations for the state of South Dakota. And I work directly with all nine tribes, but shut our borders on issues that we could agree on. And I was the liaison between the tribes and every state agency that they had. And fortunately, fortunately, my other fellow cabinet, cabinet members believed in me. So if we had issues, it wasn't some undersecretary going to talk to the tribe. It was actually the, the full cabinet member. And I also uh, advised Governor Dugard on Indian policy, uh, sovereign immunity, land and the trust issues, uh, a whole gamut of stuff. And uh, I also served on several boards. To include uh, behavioral health, juvenile justice reform, suicide prevention, and healthcare solutions, amongst many other things. And then in May of 2019, I returned here to Kyle and have been the associate judge since then. I really enjoy my job and I really enjoy the people of Kyle. And uh, some of my major accompl accomplishments was I was the vice president of Governor's Interstate Indian Council which was made up of 44 states. I also was, I also am a member of the Sakajio Yate Bar Association. I've completed advanced judicial domestic violence training. I've completed the basic domestic violence training. I uh, completed the National Institute of Trial Advocacy of Basic Criminal Skills. I have completed the National Institute of Tribal Court Advocacy advocacy skills, and I also have completed the National Institute of Trial Advocacy Teacher Training. So I became a teacher, and I taught advocates both here in South Dakota, in Navajo country, and up in North Dakota as well, to uh, how to properly uh, cross-examine somebody, direct examination, how to get evidence in, how to refresh people's recollection, so basically we were teaching tribal advocates to be better, better advocates and better servants to their clients. I've also completed the U.S. Army Legal, Legal Specialist course, U.S. Army Claims course, the U.S. Army Administration and Law for Legal Specialist course, the U.S. Jumpmaster course, U.S. Paratrooper course, U.S. Primary Leadership Development course, and basic non-commissioned officers course for legal specialists. So as you can see, I've been involved in the legal profession for quite some time. It's really been my passion and uh, I wish to continue. I think I'm doing a good job for the people of the Old Wallace Tribe. Uh, I know what judicial temperament is <laughs> and I would ask that you retain me. Uh, thank you. Uh... Secretary Emery, uh, Judge Emery. Um, Council, is there any questions at this time for Judge Emery? Uh, 
I attend every day. We do arrangements in, in several cases. And, you know, there's 48 hour rule now on the arrangements, so we have to be there. Unfortunately, we had to uh, move our criminal trials today. We do criminal trials all day Wednesday, so. Okay, and then um, currently I'm working on the Child Protection Code with our current judges as well as our CPS director. Um, and I'd like to get involved with the community as well as our elders. What are your, what is your opinion on the child protection code and what is the latest version that you know of? I normally don't do those cases out here, Kyle, but I assisted in writing the CPS code when I was a judge here prior, and it does need to be updated. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, just a, a quick question. What's your take on um, utilizing um, the code of forms of justice in criminal cases? If the parties agree to it, I, I think it would have been a good idea. Restorative justice. Because uh, the current code says that the court can invoke the code of custom law where, where it's appropriate. And, you know, from, from observing, you know, the court in the last couple of decades, you know, it's, I think if we start incorporating our own, our own form of, um, you know, our, our, um, our practice, look at the form, you know, of, um, justice practices in the court where, because, Honestly, if, I mean, if you're looking at our our uh, adult offenders facility, there's really nothing in there that um, it, that helps rehabilitate our, our offenders to, to send them back out into the community. So it's like we're we're not giving the help to our people in in our own adult offenders facility. And so I think you guys as judges have that ability. And, and personally, I'd like to see that more, but, um, you know, that's that's not my call as a council representative, but I just wanted to know your take on it. I think it would be great if, if you could get both parties to, to agree to it. And I also am concerned about the AOF not having programs, because it's been proven that you can't jail somebody out of addiction. You can't jail somebody out of a bad behavior. Uh, so I, I think it would be helpful. Okay, and then uh, another question. Um, if you come into a situation where <clears throat> um, you're, you, um, you, you have, let's say, you know, a close friend or a relative, do you recuse yourself from such cases? Absolutely. If I have any close friends, I, I mean, I have acquaintances, people that I've met, they're not an issue, but if I had a, a close friend or a family member, I, that's number one priority is to recuse yourself. And there's a judge of the laws who tried, you think it's important to keep, you know, our Lakota children with um, Lakota families as much as possible? Absolutely. Uh, the issue with that is not, fine, not having enough licensed foster parents. But, uh, when I was a judge at Crow Creek, for instance, we had a lot of operates and raising children. And we certified our own foster care homes. And it, it didn't matter if there were nine kids in there with grandma, as long as they were, because the state set so many rules. You can only have so many people in the home. You can only have so many bathrooms. You have to have a bathroom for so many kids. And, and that's not necessarily our way. You know, our grandma helped raise it. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you've got sex as long as they're being taken care of and they're healthy. Put that extra child get grandma. Don't, you know, don't pin ourselves into a hole where we can't take care of our own. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Council. Additional questions for Judge Emery? 
Good afternoon, Council. My name is Richard Bart, and I'm currently an associate judge for the Oral Officer Tribe. I have been acting in that capacity since May of 2016, so we're essentially starting next month, past five years. A little bit of my history is I have worked as a probation officer for the Oral Officer Tribal Court for about five years, and then I became a public defender for the Oral Officer Tribal Court for about approximately five years, and then I worked two years as an advocate um, in private practice. And in April of 2013, I was approached by uh, some members of council then to, if I was interested in being a prosecutor, so I accepted that. I was temporarily appointed until the council uh, in November of 2013, I uh, made that permanent. So I worked as a prosecutor with the Wallace and Tribe until uh, basically May of 2016, at which point I was transitioned to my current position. Um, I've been working primarily in the youth and family court, so I've been dealing with uh, the tackles, the custodies, the uh, Juvenile offenders stuff, um, name changes, guardianship, child support, things like that. But I've also worked in other venues like the civil court, handling the ICs, uh, things like divorces, uh, protection orders, restraining orders. Uh, and I've also, I tried to stay initially when I got into the court, I tried to stay out of the criminal court because of my history with. Uh, as a prosecutor, you want to create the conflict for interest that would inherently arise from me um, having to review cases that I was representing in trial as a prosecutor that would ultimately come before me. So there have been a number of cases um, when I first started when they asked me to do arrangements and I couldn't do them completely because on the previous matter or related to that, I was a prosecutor and that would essentially to us the conflict of interest. So um, with that, I'll take questions. Um, uh, Council, we have a uh, question at this time. Uh, Council on the spot of America, Council Van Steel, Council Van Carrello, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Council Van Carrello has a uh, first of all, let's go home. Thank you. 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 You know, earlier, I brought up the fact that, you know, we keep having the same repeat offenders, you know, and some of these uh, charges are basically the same. You know, I, I think, you know, the judges have to work more with prosecutors on whatever type of, you know, fine or whatever is being assessed to these people. But, you know, I'm like Mr. Steele. I think we need to have some type of a rehabilitation program within our courts. And I remember Mr. Poucher, you know, he was kind of taking a lot of the individuals out into the community and doing a lot of community service work. And I know they, that ain't the, the answer to it, but, you know, how, how, how would you address this? Okay, you're um, basically referring to what's considered an alternative sentencing reform act. Um, and I think it, it 
is beneficial to the community, like having them sending out crews to clean up around, pick up trash, or help people with maybe picking up around your yards, or um, just keeping the reservation area, especially when we have a high volume of traffic in all of the, the towns. Um, Try to keep those clean because you know we have tour season coming up, and so I think a lot of tourists that come here um, when they <laughs> get to the beach, so I think it's more preservable. Entice them to return to get the way they think. Now, most people are raising money; they're spending money, and that that has the economic impact. So I think that way you can help the community plus help. Now, uh, with the pandemic, it's been hard to bring in the service that we do because gap offices, which is we need as uh, referrals and having people go out there in the system staff that work at the gap office or by whatever it is, you will provide to their communities. If you were to do the job, you would have all your water bills, you don't have to run around. Uh, helping clean up around the gap office, you know, mop, empty trash, things like that. Uh, but you know, do you need to be able to right now with the pandemic situation to try to hope it opens up and be more feasible community service for the health rehabilitation that might come to help you reach that point? Um, it's probably not uh, going to work as well as it should. You know, earlier you selected an issue of police that we talked about. You know, in other communities, or two uh, police officers, but you know, we got a lot of grandmas out there that are just not going to us. You know, and I think they did a good job in the community and do community service. You know, we're supposed to find those individuals out there to do that. And we do have a program that can help provide the hard work that needs to be done in the street. You know, a lot of these housing projects. And, I'd like to see something like that done for the elders, especially the elders. Okay, uh, we were doing that, and this goes back to when I was a prosecutor. When Fred Pons was alive, and he was the uh, camp manager in Monument Ridge, we were using him. Uh, I'd say, I'd tell her, this is what I got 10, maybe 20 people that uh, need. To do some community service, we would have bought their wines because they didn't have jobs and can't pay, you know, five hundred dollar wine. So Fred and I, and we ultimately decided to get some outreach with Corey Ames, who was the captain manager in Anderson at that time. So we were referring people. We were doing just what you were talking about. He was identifying who they were identifying as potential pieces of community yards because they were elderly. So he would send workers over there, kind of like what we were doing with the neighbor stuff now, but they were doing it and then, then we tracked the hours down and that way got there the way during the way hours uh, and they would bring that paperwork back to the prosecutor to make those recommendations to the board because they had satisfied that requirement. So why was essentially addressed, but they were still responsible. That's one of the things that we were doing. Now, right now, I, I don't know what the situation is with the cap offices, if they're fully operational and their facility manager is able to bring some people in. I am, you know, two, three, four at a time. And what do we have to do? Is just take the around the building or go out into the community to provide that type of service. I, I'd have to know that. And so I, I don't know what that situation the last question is this, so the laws today that we have for, you know, youth offenders, you know, we have a lot of bad things, but when there's things like that, vandalism that goes on, a lot of the youth do it, so what, what, what kind of a program do we have for them? And what, what is the punishment for, or, or just house for a year? 
or something or no? Well, for each juvenile offense, so the maximum penalty for for any charge is 15 days per offense. That's what it is now. Fines aren't any different than they are for adults. But when it comes to the sentence and guidelines, and the maximum per offense, whether it's say assault in the first degree or just disorderly conduct, because that's just the way the code is written right now. You have the council to change that code. Now, if you were going to increase the length of sentences, because you have the same individuals in the community, you know, then you probably need to look at uh, maybe increasing the length of sentences, but then also that would include uh, probably um, changing the format as to whether or not those individuals are entitled to a jury trial, because the current court for adults says that one, if the offense is 30 or more days of incarceration, these individuals are entitled to a jury trial. So if you're going to take that standard, which is the adult standard, and apply it to the juveniles, then you have to come before you get the same rights. So, so what you're saying is for juveniles, regardless of what the offense, maximum is 15 days per charge. So if they have, say, Three charges, three separate charges, and you went with consecutive sentencing guidelines, then each 15 days, once they're out, you're looking at a maximum of 45 days on that. Or if it's more than 60 days. But it depends on the severity and the history. Because a lot of a lot of the um, individuals that come for not only me to the family court, but in adult criminal court. They're the same individuals essentially doing the same thing, just in different ways of time. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Steele, and Councilman Spider. Okay, I'm going to pose the same question to you, sir. Um, uh, what you take on um, um, using a, a code of forms of justice in regards to criminals? Okay, I did not hear you ask this question to Judge Henry. I think if we were going to do that, we need to establish some, basically some rules on that. And it has to be written down as to how we apply that so we don't have this standard applying here and then a totally separate standard applying somewhere else to somebody who essentially committed the same offense. So I think there should be some kind of guidelines that what would be the recommendation or what we should take into consideration is the victim, the victim who was, uh, you know, maybe that their car windows broken out or house window broken out or something that someone that part of their property vandalized. Then the victim actually should have a right to have some say as to um, how do I fix the wrong that was committed upon me. So they should have some input there whether it's restitution or some other form of compensation. Maybe it's, uh, maybe they broke a fence or, or broke a window and then, you know, fix that window or re repair that fence. If it's a car window, then uh, restitution of car windows aren't cheap. I mean, uh, a windshield was anywhere from 250 on up, so that, you know, and, and how they do it, they put that hours, you know, especially if it's on an elderly. Because the elderly and children are almost one people on this track, and they're victimizing far too often. Um, so you, you stated earlier that you know, in, in, in your uh, in your judgeship, um, you know, your term here, you, you did tackle orders and whatnot. Um, was there any instances where you found that you didn't do yourself and you didn't know if you were closely related to someone? Or uh, yeah, I will. I mean, because the law and order code said for the rules of the judges, there is called a degree of separation. So there should be two degrees of separation. So everybody within that first degree is you are actually your brothers, your sisters, your mother, your fathers. Okay. 
in your children. The second degree separation is going to be your grandparents or your aunts and uncles and neighbors. And everybody outside of that, um, you shouldn't have to redeem yourself unless there's uh, a significant amount of interaction. Or if it's something you may not maybe even more distant to the kids, but you can see them visit with them in the house, they have to be in the house. Um, those situations you should probably accuse yourself. Now I had a situation that I go the last couple of days where I had to do that because um, I was close enough to the kid and there was enough social interaction that I did. Yeah, um, last question is, you know, as a judge of the lawsuit tribe, how strongly do you feel about keeping our Lakota children with, with our own people? I, I believe very strongly in that because I do handle all those temples or most of those temples. The situation with that, though, that's the judge. When he gives care placement and supervision to Child Protective Services, then it's CPS who is making the determination as to where that child is being placed, okay? And then they report back to the court when they do their court reports. And they tell them you know, how they're doing, what, what they're doing, where they're at. That's CPS's role in this. So as a judge, though, it's ultimately your responsibility or your, your judgment to place, place the child either with CPS or a no. relative? No, when, okay, when you... Okay, when you have a tackle, which is a temporary emergency custody unit, that's what that stands for. Okay, the procedure is that when the child is removed, now the tackle law that's on the books right now says that within 72 hours of the child being removed from the family, then they must be served notice that a petition is being filed. Okay, so you have a hearing. You don't have it within 72 hours, but you need to have it soon, and I would say within a week or two. Okay, at that point, the parents are notified as to the hearing date and time. All right, the parents come to the court, the prosecution, and the CPS are here. We advise them of their rights. Okay, what's going on? Give them the option as to if they need an attorney to assist them. I usually grant them what's called a 14 day advice. I give them two weeks to one hire a lawyer if they can need help. Okay. We advise them of their rights. We read the petition because in the petition contains the allegation of alleged neglect or abuse or whatever caused the removal of those children. And once they've been, if they request a 14 day, I tell them it's going to be a repeat of this hearing, and I expect them to meet it with the lawyer because that's what you're asking for. You're saying, I need legal help, and I don't have it, so I need two weeks to hire. All right, so then you get to the 14 day advisory again, repeat of that initial hearing. You, then at that point, you ask whether they admit or deny the allegation, which is similar to an arraignment if we were to the matter. So either they admit or they deny. If they admit, then you'll take some recommendations from Child Protective Services and the prosecution as to what they want them to do. The parenting classes, you know, home drug eval, a mental health evaluation, if CPS should go in there and do a home study or a safety plan, and you set up a review date. Now that review date can be anywhere from one day up to 90 days, but not more than 90 days. And at which point it gives CPS, it gives the parents, an opportunity to start that process early. But when, once they enter the plea, whether they admit or deny, the court gives Child Protective Services the authority for care, placement, and supervision of that child. So what CPS does is they'll, they're supposed to go find the primary relative placement. 
so it should be placed with another family member. Okay. I don't know if they always do that because after I give them the authority or the care plan and supervision, where they place that individual is that their determination. And then when we come back for the reviews, if they admitted to the allegation, then they bring a court report to us, tell us what's going on, how they're doing, what, where they're at, that sort of thing. Okay, um, and just, you know, the reason why I bring that up, and you, you said that you made a statement when you gave them custody. Um, I've, I've, I've heard this in the past, being a, <clears throat> being a council representative and, and, you know, a leader of my community, I, people come and, and, and they, with concerns, and one of the statements made by some CPS workers, you know, you make them, we take them. And that attitude there, you know, it, it, it feels like our, and when, when they have control of the situation, our people feel helpless when they go into the court system because ultimately the judges, they side with CPS. Not always. And, and that's how our people feel. And that's coming from myself personally because I have a lot of people that have come to me on issues. And so a lot of our people feel helpless when it does come to court because a majority, I'll say a greater majority of the times, the court sides with CPS, and and like I said, our, our people feel helpless, and that's why I, that was the purpose of asking those questions. Uh, and I understand that because some of those are sensitive issues. All right, you're dealing most of the time with younger children, and any time you're dealing with younger children, and this goes to custody, to guardianship. People, especially the parents in the custody, those are emotional cases. Okay. Mothers emotional, fathers emotional, because they both want custody of their children, all right? And so my role as a judge in that situation is try to be the unemotional individual in the room and try to keep things balanced and fair, okay? Because when you have parents pitted against each other, there's a lot of times when it's, they, don't, they want it their way. And the other person, they, you know, I, it's either my way or the highway situation. And somewhere in there, you need to find the balance between the two. That, you know, everybody's not going to get everything in, 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 especially a custody situation. So you try to find something that works for them. You try to give them equal access to that child. Now, in the TECO situations, it's because the children are removed simply because mom or dad or both were arrested because they were intoxicated or a situation or an incident happened at their home where the law enforcement was called. And the determination was made by law enforcement that there is a very real threat to the safety and well-being of these children. Okay, so they notify Child Protective Services who then make that initial contact with the kids, with the parents, and if they find that sufficient grounds exist to remove, then they remove. But if they do that, then like I said, they have to serve them with a notice of hearing that a petition is being filed within 72 hours and that a hearing date will be scheduled at least within two weeks of that notice. Now, there are situations when uh, CPS says, you know, after doing your initial investigation that there's a, there isn't sufficient grounds to proceed. And they'll come in and they'll just ask, you know, at that hearing, we vote to dismiss because there's really nothing here to pursue. Now, as far as the, you make them, we pay, I don't know where that came from. It certainly didn't come from the real my court. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Sutler. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, uh, Mr. Bark. I just have one question regarding the Child Protection Code and what version are you using? And with it, um, with it being updated, would you consider the elderly input? We're, we're supposed to be working on that. Um, I was actually assigned to that project uh, at our last child protection meeting we had in Rapid City, 
probably what two or three weeks ago. Um, the current version that's being used is the one that was passed. It, it was basically under the Lowell division. Okay. Now there is a uh, currently there is a a formatted updated code that's got a lot of line outs in there where language needs to be changed. Now I think if you want to bring elders in to put their input, they should probably be a part of that process too, because you're going to essentially mount to a page by page analysis and breakdown of that entire code. I think there are like 103 pages in that code. So if you do that, then you want to bring you want elderly input there, then you want to have them every time you can do for a meeting. Because that's that's going to be a long process. That's not something that's just going to happen in two and a half days or three days. That's that's because, like I said, you're going to take the entire code, you're going to go through it page by page, what needs to be amended, what needs to be removed, and where do we add in the recommendation from the elders. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council. Good evening. I'm Richard Littlehawk. I'm currently the associate judge in Pine Ridge. My primary responsibility is mainly in the criminal area. I do take civil cases when assigned um, or if there's a conflict of interest. I take uh, youth and family court cases when Judge Mark recuses himself. Uh, so my, my primary responsibility is in the criminal cases that are in Pine Ridge. In 1978, I attended the uh, Antioch School of Law in Washington, D.C. And I graduated with a legal technician certificate along with several other tribal members. There's only a, two of us left from that group. We both work in a court system. Um, from 1978 to the current to current time, I have worked primarily in the Bandage Tribal Court, mainly as a prosecutor for a little over 14 years. I also worked as an advocate, a juvenile prosecutor, a legal clerk. Um, prosecutorial investigator and a period of time in 1988 to 1994 I sat on the tribal council representing Wapami district. I served on several committees. At one point I was the chair of the law and order committee and within the certain times within that time period I also worked as a, a held an elective office in the community, held community positions, treasurer, president at one time, twice in Makwani District, and also sat on several um, uh, organizations that the tribe created. One is the Parks Board, Personnel Board, and most recently, I think I sat on a, um, um, I don't recall that one, but maybe it's all public service work that I did. I haven't had a merit system employee employment for some time. 
I think I served as a, a, a clerk of court for the Supreme Court for a few months, and I was a merit system position. All of the positions I had were either elective office or appointments by a tribal council. And I think at one point I served as a, a election board, tribal election board member with a couple of colleagues who are not here now, Mr. Max Mastiff and Vincent Brewer Sr. Uh, so most of my time was spent within the judicial system of the tribe. Um, in this recent time I'm serving um, <clears throat> and we're running for the second term as an associate judge. And my primary responsibility is in the criminal, uh, as a criminal judge. Uh, with that, um, I'll take questions. Uh, Councilors, any questions? Uh, Councilman Carlo and Councilman Steele. I just got a comment here, sir. You know, you have a long history of service, Joe Guala Sioux. I just want to commend you. You know, I think it was just a year ago, your hair was jet black and you had a blade down your back. So I can see the effects of hard work, what it does to a man who turns his hair gray. But, you know, I just want to commend you for your years of service, not only to the district governments, but to overall the overall Sioux tribe. So this is my comment and thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carlo. Um, I think at the last time I ran in 2017, Judge Modelo made the same comment. He said he came in with uh, hair on his head and he was black and he left with his, his bald and white hair. Uh, thank you, Councilman, uh, Councilman Steele and Councilman Little Thunder. <clears throat> I came into council when I was 25 and I'm bald and I'm only 40. Um, I guess I could impose the same questions. I mean, you've been a judge, you know, for some time and involved with the court. Um, would you would you feel like, um, I wouldn't say, I would, uh, would, would you like to see the court or as a judge, you know, impose, you know, more Lakota forms of justice in criminal cases. I mean, like I stated before, and, in, in, you know, out to the AOF, we really don't rehabilitate our offenders out there and they pretty much go back into the community, you know, the same way they went in. And it's like, for our, for me personally, I don't see them getting the, the help. I mean, so it's a judge. Is something that you know would, would be a possibility because under the code chapter 11 it says that the, the, the tribe can invoke a code of custom law where you know where 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 appropriate i think that the direction the court can take you know, is the, from the laws that the tribal council enacts and that's basically what we follow um our court system is an ideal court system where one party loses and one party wins. <clears throat> but I read recently where uh, the Supreme Court provided guidance where uh, parties can resolve differences through mediation or traditional methods. And I believe that's something that the tribal council can enact to direct the tribal court to uh, incorporate the cultural aspects into the court system. And that would be a, an improvement because this form of justice or this form of court was imposed upon us from the outside. So you see a cultural clash right there from the dominant society into Lakota, Lakota ways. And that cultural conflict or clash itself uh, appears to create more problems than it solves. And in some of our court decisions, uh, in civil, especially in civil cases, um, we've incorporated uh, 
discussions amongst uh, the opposing council to come to some resolution of their problem. Because basically the courts are there to resolve problems between parties uh, and to work with the uh, um, trying to resolve matters that are criminal in nature. Uh, but in line with what you're saying, it's uh, there's several entities involved in the tribal court system. It's the prosecutor's office, the attorney general, as well as uh, uh, the defendant. So in those matters, <clears throat> I believe if the parties decide to come to a resolution, and try to resolve a uh, criminal matter. Um, <clears throat> in our court system, we call them plea bargains or maybe dispositional hearings where the parties sit down and discuss um, <clears throat> pleading guilty to an appropriate sentence um, if in fact they're guilty. But um, I think we're all in this together, the tribal council, as well as the court and law enforcement. And I think the major impetus of resolving conflicts and problems would, would um, probably be a major step or to communication between the parties. Um, uh, but it'll take legislation from the tribal council to address those issues, uh, Mr. Steele. Okay. Um... And, and the other question, you know, I won't ask you, and, and that was in regards to recuse yourself, because that's, you know, one good statement I heard about yourself as a judge is that you do recuse yourself when, yeah. when, when appropriate. My other question would be, um, so how strong, you know, as an Ogosu tribal judge, how strongly do you feel about keeping our Lakota children with our, with our tribal members? I think that was the major impetus of the Indian Child Welfare Act was to keep children within our culture and within the immediate family. So I believe all of the court uh, judges support that uh, support that issue. Okay, thank you for your service, Mr. Lilha. Uh Thank you, Mr. Steele. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Uh, Council, additional questions for Mr. Uh, Judge Lilha. Uh Or Council Level Sorry about that. Sorry, again. But, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, welcome uh, evening here uh, for Mr. Little Hall. You know, uh, I know he's talked about the, uh, being in the judicial system as a judge for quite a while here. Then I know he's a uh, very culturally aspect, but a Lakota way. So uh, I believe that he talks Lakota, Lakota, I hope. Uh, okay. 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 I know we started out uh, uh, cultural aspect well, of Lakota, you know, some of the people that are uh, fluent in Lakota, you know, it would be easier to talk to talk with them in Lakota, so, you know, to work both ways with the uh, Lakota cultural aspects, you know, in, in order to put into numerous times to come to court, you know, that seems like it's all alcohol and drugs related that uh, been involved in uh, addiction with the chemicals, you know, that uh, time and time again, it seems like they come, come back to court, you know. Then I think uh, going to the court, I think we need to curb that in order to get them some help, you know, in order to get them some help to maybe go to a uh, cultural aspect of going to taking sweats and sun dances and so forth, or either get some uh, counseling from uh, medicine men or you know, spiritual leaders to. Um, get, get them some assistance, you know, to, to curb that, to get away from that, uh, from the way of life with a uh, negative side of it, you know, getting in trouble, going to jail time after time again. So, um, maybe a uh, question for Mr. Lillehawk is, uh, I don't know, maybe he called, got a lot of um, people that go to jail and go in front of him, you know, so uh, maybe for his question is, uh, well, what uh, what route would you take with you know, all these numerous clients that have come, come to uh, in front of you to, uh, you have to face the judge, you know, so what would, uh, what the decisions you make, you know, about how that would affect the children, how, 
all the way from uh, grandchildren to elderly. So I've never fixed my own land. So in order to curb that road, what would you do? Um, in a criminal court, um, generally the judge is supposedly uh, objective, uh, impartial, and the defendant is considered innocent until proven guilty. And the responsibility of the Attorney General's office is to find that person guilty through evidence and testimony presented to the court. So it places a judge in a position of uh, trying to, uh, working with both parties to see that the process involved is fair, uh, fair and protects the defendant's rights also. So the judge makes a decision based on um, what the attorney general's prosecutors present to the court. And if the evidence is sufficient enough, uh, the court can find them guilty and apply a sentence that is appropriate. And generally the sentence recommendation comes from the prosecutor who is prosecuting the case as well as the defendant and his advocate, they can always recommend a sentence on their behalf. So that burden lies with those parties. Uh, if they want an alternative sentence, like a uh, uh, cultural sentence based, uh, some sentence that would um, come into play, uh, incorporating the cultural aspects of it, that's a matter the court can also consider Okay, uh, thank you for your response. Yeah. What was that? Uh, Council, is there other questions for uh, Judge Rubal? Uh Hearing or seeing none online, uh, thank you, Judge. Appreciate it. Uh, and if you just want to have a seat, you could. Uh, okay, all right, thank you. Um, so next, we got uh, Judge Husman. If you want to come up? My name is John Hussman. I have been an associate judge for four years now. And uh, I'm, I guess, reapplying for the job, so to speak. That's why I'm here. Uh, when I first came here, I, I was going to say good morning. But I guess that we're kind of past that. But in any event, uh, the, ex the experience that I've had basically is, a, I think it was about 1976. 7, 1977, I became a police officer at the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, LAPD gave me six months of legal training and in every type of law imaginable, uh, criminal law, civil law, regulatory law, statutory law, all of that, even traffic law, and you go down the line. But the thing is, is that uh, I, I guess we're kind of evolving as a tribe and then to actually develop a code uh, for, 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 I guess, to, to compare with that. Uh, some of the questions that the council have been asking were pretty good. Well, and anyway, let me I'll finish up. Okay, I started then, I called Fred Kubels, he was captain of police at that time. And he said, come on back. He said, we'll give you a job. And so I came back and then I started working for a, for a I guess uh, uh, the police department, it wasn't public safety at that time. And Fred as a captain was probably about the best captain you're ever gonna meet. He had really good common sense and he really had a good uh, sense of uh, humanity. And because of that, I believe I le learned a lot from Fred as well. Uh, the two takeaways that, that, I, that I got from the Los Angeles Police Department 
one of the instructors opened his, his, his presentation by saying, uh, saying uh, when a tree falls in a forest, it doesn't make a sound. And when you think of it, it's kind of a ridiculous question. But as he explained it, the, the, what he meant was that if a crime is committed and the police officer responding to the call does not have the knowledge or experience to identify what happened as a crime, and basically no sound has been made because it will not be in his report. In his report. It will not be investigated because of the fact that nobody knows that it happened in the first place. The other thing that uh, I think it was on our last day of training, uh, another instructor told me that, uh, that uh, you, when you are a police officer, you are obligated to enforce all of the laws. That includes the Bill of Rights. As, as it is, because that is a law, and, and, it's, and it's more important, or just as important, for some of the laws that you're going to be enforcing. Now, when I started with public safety, I took an oath. The oath was to, to enforce all of the laws in the codes, and also to, to, to enforce all of the laws contained in the constitution of this tribe. And basically, that's where I get my lead and my direction from. And so far, I believe it has served me well. And then I will continue to do that if I'm uh, reinstated as a judge. The questions that you asked too, I mean, you know, I was listening about children and all of that. Uh, I read the Youth and Family Code there several times that I had the occasion to enforce it. But in that code, it, it, start, it starts out, I think in the very first paragraph by saying, Tankashila is the only person that has the right to, 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 to take away the rights of a parent, words to that effect. And I believe that. And then from there, it gets in, in, into like a, a six month period, in which case, the, if, if, there, if there is like physical harm done to the child, if there's neglect or anything like that, and, and the parent has responsibility or culpability in that situation, then, uh, uh, according to the code, then the judge must take, take take that child and remove him from that house in, in, into a place of safety. And while he's at that safety, then it, uh, usually the judge will also, uh, I, I guess, uh, outline a program of sobriety and also of like anger management and all of that, so so, so, that, the, so that the parents can become better parents when they get their children back. But that's the objective. That's the objective of that code. It's to re reunification within a six month period of time. Now, if the parents are unwilling to, to work with, with, with uh, I guess, the people that are involved in that situation, then there will be consideration by tribal law of removing that child permanently from that home, especially if the parents cannot offer that uh, child a safe and, and healthy environment. No, uh, I, I guess I've been lucky, like in civil court, of having a staff, a staff that I work with. The staff that I work with, uh, they, they, they are really into the jobs that they have. When we get someone that is referred to our court through either the prosecutor's office or my, my family referral, we'll accept that. Then, then and what we do is, 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 that, is that we, in preparation for, for, for what needs to be happening, uh, there will be like a, like a psychological examination set up. And based on that, a, a, a methodology, I guess, developed by the Indian Health Service that our clerks will call into the game, so to speak, so that we do have professionals involved in, in, in what is transpiring. Now, a lot of times through the Indian Health Service, we do have an opportunity to utilize other resources that may not, may not be locally present. As a matter of fact, we've sent uh, people who have been addicted to drugs as far away as California because they seem to have the right program. And to my knowledge, the Indian Health Service has provided the money for that. Uh, there's different uh, resources, I guess, that we have now, but I think most of the testimony here by the judges point to the fact that we do not have the resources we need to handle every case as expediently as, as it should be happen, happening. 
There was one guy out of Manderson, I forgot his name, Whitecomb, I think it was per Percy, was it? Percy Whitecomb? He was working with children and, and uh, he, he was using, uh, I guess, horse psychology, as he called it, so that he used horses so that if he got, they got along front to get along with horses, then basically that would, that would enhance their ability to get along, period, in, in this world that we live in. Uh, I guess having said that, I know I haven't uh, covered all of the bases, so to speak. So if there's any questions, I'm go, go ahead. Uh, Councilors, any questions? Uh, uh, Chairman Watkins, do you have a... Okay, go ahead, Chairman Watkins. John, no, listening to you, I know you... You know what you're doing on drug deal. I want to ask you, what do you all, these dumb drug dealers that get busted and sent to, to the, the courthouse? Um, I know we had to push it on that, that stay deal because they're being let out. What's your um, idea on that? Excuse me? The drug dealers here on the reservation we made several laws on council floor. One of them was that the busted and um, found guilty being a dealer with the map that can be removed off the reservation. Then we started having um, people getting busted for drugs going to the courthouse and then they were being released so we had to bring that issue up again where it was in the ordinance that they'd be held for 872 hours. But what's your idea on that, on our drug dealers? What should be done with them? Okay, first of all, we do have a tribe, we do have tribal codes, and basically, as I said, I generally try to follow them. I mean, there's been little occasion where I've stepped outside of that. But by that, I mean that sometimes they have, I guess, an arrest that is made, or they don't know who those drugs belong to. So they may have three or four people involved in, in that vehicle, and then they charge everybody with, with all of those drugs. So usually until they can identify who the owner of those drugs are, then everybody sits in jail until that time happens. Now, basically, according to our tribal code, I, I don't believe that we have the authority to do that because it's, it's usually a federal process. And if somebody wants to make a federal case out of it, that's fine. But by the same token, like you said, they have like 72 hours to get a hold of a federal magistrate or a federal judge and get a warrant for his arrest and send the U.S. Marshal Service down to the tribal jail to pick him up and take him back to that, where he can be held legally. Because anything beyond that outside of our tribal law is a violation of his civil rights. Thank you. Uh, Councilor, additional questions for Judge Hussman? Uh, seeing none, Judge Hussman, I think you're good. Yeah, so, yeah, so I think you're good. I don't see any other questions in there, Judge. So, okay, yeah, I think you're good. Thank you. Yeah, okay, I think you're good. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
SRO officer and for 13 years the evidence tech. Um, I come from the Tubo Estuary down in Wretched Table. I, after I retired in January of 2018, I stayed in went to I went to the courthouse one time and um, my coworker, Brian Hono, she told me that they needed a prosecutor, so I put in for it. And um, I was selected by the, I mean, the attorney general um, said he would hire me. And being a dispatcher, or excuse me, um, evidence technician, I had to take in all the evidence that come from the police, police officers, if they arrested somebody, um, what they were charged with, what kind of weapon it was, or whatever, and um, the code, the section, what they were being charged with. So that helped me out a lot when I started uh, working as a prosecutor. And um, I was taught by the best, Bernona. She was there for years and she helped me, um, taught me how to do things. And from then I, I started doing um, free trials, um, reviews, motions, um, bench trials. And I did two jury trials. And, um, it was good. We're now we're back to doing dispositional hearings, which the defendant has the right to come back. Okay, first of all, when they go to agreement, they give them a date, so they come back, and if they want to um, change their plea to guilty, then we set up a pre-trial, and then. Um, if they agree to, then we do that, and the judge reads it all over. Uh, if it's okay, then he grants it. And then they start their community service, and they're fine. They're, um, they're um, court costs, you know, all of that. So we've been pretty busy. We have dispositionals every day, Monday through Friday. And then every every uh, couple months we rotate. So I, when I come to Kyle, then I stay over here. I mean, I come every day for two weeks and then go back over there. So when Renona comes out, then I step in and do her involuntary commitment. That's any questions. Hi, I'm Councilman Watkins. Yeah. Um, what made you want to run for being a judge? Um, I, I, I thought about it and then I forgot to write the, um, I forgot to write the letter of intent and then I thought, okay, I'll just um, disregard it. But I know I'm, I'm, I'm a good, I could be a good judge too. Well, can you bring in my career closer to that? Come here over here. <laughs> um, I told, I just said that. I think I could be a, a good judge too, because of all of the experience I have. Um, the second question um, on, on this game kind of keyword of compliment still was asking about um, on a family code on the CPS. Um, I think he talked about the, the rights of people, the elderly and stuff are having trouble with it. What do you think about that? Um, and, and there, I hardly ever go in there, but I step in and I have to. So. Um, I believe that, you know, they, they should be, it should be dealt with, you know, right away. Um, 
when I've been in there, you know, it's, it's, it's like once every, um, not too much, because I deal mostly in cream. They so do all the other stuff, green beds and, and veg tiles. That's all good. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Uh, additional questions? Uh, Council, Mr. Russo? Uh, Council, Mr. Russo? Thank you, Mr. Russo. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Mr. Russo. Appreciate our service and the courts and uh, just our justice and downs. Thank you. Um, so, Council, uh, so I believe that Ms. Kills right is withdrawn and uh, Ms. Bear uh, Runner is in the paper. Oh, she's online. Oh, she's online. Oh, she's online. Um, oh, Ms. Kills right. Uh, so, did you withdraw from the, the judge? So yeah, so Miss uh, Miss uh, Kills right with drama for the associate judges um, and Miss Miss Kara. Okay. Um, so, Council, so I, I believe Ms. Guerra is not online. Ms. Kilsvite has withdrawn from the Associate Judge. So, there's four, uh, you heard from uh, Judge Emery, Judge Bart, Judge Usman, Judge Little Hop, and Ms. Musso. Um, Council, how would you like to uh, proceed? Just, uh, Thompson Steele. I believe on Mr. Phil Spike also. I don't know if he got on Zoom. He's, he's not registered. Is there a, somebody on iPhone? He, I don't know if he's registered uh, as the judge. I, I, I know that he's registered as a prosecutor. Did he, was he applying to be a judge? No, he, he put, on, put in for both. Oh, he yeah. did. Okay. Uh, this is a letter you sent us. It says OST Travel Council from the Land Supply at March 3rd, 2021. Letter of intent for OST Travel Prosecutor. Okay. Uh, please accept this letter of intent for the position of the prosecutor at the OST Attorney General Office. I was an emergency hire to help the try to accept the state position. Prosecutor on July 17, 2017, said the White Council to approve the starting. November 2017, for three year appointments in and I'm running the fund that I'm registering to team to help our people. And the most important was our tribe, that the prosecutor of the laws we try. Thank you for your time and inspiration. If you have questions or concerns, you can contact me at OST General's Office 605 2095 or email. Um, doesn't state his intention to be judged. Chairman? Yes. Um, one of the con one of the, the applicants is 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 willing to do the, the interview on phone if the, if that's okay. Um, is it? Um, Miss Barron. Miss Barron. Okay. She's. Is it okay if I put it on the mic? Okay. Go ahead, Lonnie. Hello. Uh, Miss Barron, go ahead. Uh, you have ten minutes. On uh, however you want to use that ten minutes. You could talk about your background, your experience, all that. Uh, if you just want to go that and take questions from the council, it's, it's up to you. It's, uh, it's your tenants. And we'll start it right now. Thank you. Hello. Okay, I'm sorry. I cannot hear that. I did not hear that at all. It's a little distant. Okay, hello, my name is Bonnie Omni Berner. Um, I am an enrolled member of the Alaska tribe. My parents are Edgar and Violet Berner. I do come from the Berner 
from White Face and Blue Shields Bays. Um, I was born and raised on the reservation. I lived most of my entire life in Port Um This time was most of my life here. Um, school, um, work. I did leave for education. I did return. I'm currently sitting in a hospital. Temporarily, I was hired in June of 2020 as a temporary prosecutor um, during the COVID pandemic. I think we're short staffed at the time. And I have been still in this position since and had really a great experience in the, the teachings and everything that I have been able to do this far. I don't really like to talk about myself, so if we can just move forward to the questions. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, Councils, are is there any questions for Ms. Vera at this time? Uh, uh, Council, are there any questions for Ms. Vera at this time? And uh, Council, so can she hear us? Uh, yeah. Oh, you scared us? Okay. Oh, you did? Okay. Cool. Um, I don't see any questions. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see any questions at this time, Council. Um, thank you, Ms. Berger. I appreciate your time. I know that you put in for the prosecutor position as well. Um, so if you just want to stand by and, uh, and, uh, We'll, we'll figure this process out. So thank you again for, for your interest and uh, for jumping on. Right, thank you, Chairman. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and I believe Mr. Phil's the pipe's on right now. Um, Mr. Phil's the pipe, can you hear us? Uh, Mr. Phil's the pipe, can you hear us? Chairman. Uh, Tessa. I think at the time when he stated he didn't have um, the Zoom application on his phone, so I don't know if you can hear us, but Mr. Philsfight, there's a mute button on that uh, on, on your Zoom. If you could uh, hit that one, then we'll be able to hear you here. Uh, apparently his mic is unmuted right now. Mr. Fulton, why can you ask? Uh, so we can't hear right now, Council. So I, I, I'm going to proceed on this. Somebody's calling me. Hello. Yeah. Chairman. Uh, yes. Can we do the same ladies on the phone? Um, can he clarify for the record that what his intention was? Because when he originally put in his letter of intent, there was no, uh, there was no, uh, he just stated that he wouldn't be part of prosecutors. If you uh, intended to put in for the associate judge and the prosecutor. Uh, are you uh, able to hear on the mic? Can uh, I would be willing to put in for both. Excuse me? I'd be willing to put in both positions. This is if there's a need for a judge.
Um, okay, uh, if you can put those up by uh, Um, if you want to, if you want to go ahead and state on uh, just your intention, uh, and then we can give you about ten minutes to speak. And um, so, if you want to do your, your position for the the, the judge, uh, we could take that right now. So you have ten minutes. Council's been uh, hearing people's positions, and. Uh, uh, so if you want to help with your experience, your introduction, your background, or if you want to also ask questions, that, that's up to you, uh, Mr. Pilsbeck. Uh, good evening. My name is Lance Pilsbeck. Uh, my intention would be, if there is a position open for an associate judge, um, I would like to apply for that position. And also, if that position is filled, that would be considered to continue being the prosecutor for the OLC trap. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor, any questions for Mr. Pilsen? Uh, go ahead, uh, Councilman uh, Carl. I wonder if uh, Mr. Phil's if I could give us a little history or maybe an education or something like that. Okay. Uh, my class will be uh, 47 years old. Um, I do have an associate's of science degree in criminal justice. Um, I'm about a semester away from a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Uh, my original intentions with going both was so I could be in a position of me competitive for a chief of police or captain of police position, but unfortunately, uh, Life didn't have that uh, in the cards for me. Um, ended up going through a divorce, and that pretty much limited my chances at college at the time because I needed to pull kids on my children. Um, I believe my GPA was a 3.99 GPA in order for whenever I graduated from United Tribes Technical College when I got the Associate of Applied Science degree. Um, I was taking classes with Minot State University and, and taking the junior and senior level classes, I had a 3.2 GPA. Um, as far as work history goes, I have about six years total law enforcement experience here with the Wallace and Traffic Department of Public Safety. And I honestly lost count on the number of years working, uh, whether it be with IHS Hospital here in Kinder Ridge, uh, Brave Wings Casino, and also campus security at United Tribes Technical College. Um, I was a full time student and also uh, working full time to support my family when I was going to school in this morning. As far as the prosecutor experience, I've been in my position for approximately four years. Um, I've worked in all aspects of our positions, uh, most focused in youth and family court. Um, so I guess out of the prosecutors, I would probably be the one with the most knowledge when it comes to um, temporary emergency custody orders, um, Indian Child Welfare Act, dealing with uh, parents and trying to keep them the tools to help them make better decisions in life. Um, but I've also been a part of the Adult Criminal Court and prosecuting the cases at that level and working with the four associate judges as well as uh, in the same courtroom as the chief judge. I agree with you guys. Um, thank you, Mr. Bill's and uh, 
And Council, is there any other questions that we have for Mr. Filzenbeck at this time? Uh, Mr. Filzenbeck, so did you submit your resume and the, the all that kind of stuff? Submitted when I first put in for this position a little over three years ago. Uh, the only reason I'm not there in person is because I was in court and I did not know that the positions were advertised. Uh, normally, we have a list of all the job openings posted at our office for the public. Uh, unfortunately, with the coronavirus, I didn't see one, so I didn't know that there was a deadline for the position or else I would have submitted an application, resume, and everything else that was required. Uh, and without going, I went about my regular day um, taking care of the docking. All right, thank you. Um, council, so I'll, I'll leave it up to you to council on how they're going to proceed if they want to accept this as uh, his letter of intent to also be included the judge, the vote for the judges. Um, just because, you know, it didn't state that. I have his letter of intent up here and it didn't state that anywhere. Um, and we also have like the letters of intent from all the judges that was passed out that stating that they were, um, they did want to be considered for associate judge. Um, we got Miss Kills, Kills Wright submitted one, but she goes wrong to the Drewers. Um, I believe Miss Fairliners uh, is with your applications as well, but there's no letter of intent. I didn't see one at least. So, uh, council, I'll just, I'll just leave it up to you if you, however you want to proceed. And I, I don't know if, if you saw the form. Um, um, uh, Councilman Carlin. Ms. Terry, you know, the previous selection for chief uh, of police, you know, we, even though there were only two that were certified by the HR, you know, we allowed every one of them to do a presentation. So I think we need to follow the same procedure here. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, I, you know, I would just ask that we have an official action on that as well, um, just to make sure that we're in compliance, uh, Councilman Steele. And just for the record, we're at 14 members right now, so if we lose one person, um, <laughs> we can't move on, so. Chairman, um, he, when they did con contact me this morning, I didn't have an answer. I told them that, um, that those, those, the, there was a cutoff line. However, he did say that he was in court the day of the cutoff line. And so I just told him to submit a resume, which was forwarded on to the secretary or a letter of intent that he submitted. So that was the only documentation that I, I done. Let him know that the, the time, time frame was coming down as far as submitting the documentation. And I told him that it, it would be a call by the, the tribal council to allow him to proceed, but just to, to give the document to the secretary, which states, did you receive the document? Yeah, we have it, so we gave okay, it. Okay, so, so the secretary did receive his letter of intent. And and you know what, what Mr. Mr. Uh, Carlos said is, you know, earlier we, we, we accepted uh, applicants that weren't qualified according to HR. To, to give an interview for the chief of police and, you know, if we're going to open the door for individuals, you know, we, we need to be fair to all the people that are interested in, you know, being that um, Mr. Philspike is a current prosecutor, I, I think, I mean, it's proper to, to allow him to continue in, in, in that field of work, but that's me personally, but I, I still think it, it should be a decision by the council to consider. Uh, okay, thank you, Councilman. So, appreciate the clarification. Um, uh, Council, I mean, it's on you uh, how you're going to proceed uh, with that application. Make a motion, Mr. Chairman, to accept this. Uh, uh, could you use your mic, uh, Councilman Carl? Thank you. Yeah, see around that thing right there is kind of tough. 
Uh, you can see the man over here. I'll make a motion that Mr. Phil's pipes uh, application be accepted. Uh, is there a second? I'll second. Uh, second by Councilman Steele. Uh, is there any discussion on that, Council? Uh, Councilman Young. Is that for both positions or just prosecutor? Yeah, he, he added. Um, just for the record, that, uh, to answer Councilman Youngman's question, that uh, he did get his letter in for the prosecutor, uh, but we're just voting on how to accept it for the judge. Chip, so, uh, further questions, Council? Um, Heron, we're seeing none. Um, Secretary, if you want to uh, run the vote, thank you. Wesley Hawkins Sr. Oh. Blaine Little Thunder. Oh. Carl Whitehorse. Yes. Ryan Jumping Eagle Sr. Ryan Jumping Eagle Sr. Gerald Kenoya Jr. Yes. Austin Watkins Sr. Oh. Tyler Yellowboy. Wendell Youngman Jr. Yes. Ron DeBray. James Cross. Yes. Ella John Carlo. No. George Jr. Jr. Yes. Jillian Spotted Bear. David Queer. No. Sonia Little Pop Weston. Jackie Sears. Yeah. Michael Carlo Sr. Yes. Garfield Still? Yeah. Greg Dillon? No. Uh, Council, so we got 10 yes, 5 no, and 4 not voting. Thank you, Council. So we'll add them to the list. Um, so in the past, uh, as, as uh, I think there's four positions on Council, uh, we have, I believe, six candidates. Um, and this, oh, we got them ready. Okay. Um, start in arms if you want to get ready and get those ballots up and uh, do the positions. Um, yeah, and write down four names, Council, for this. And uh, and we can go with uh, the top four vote getters. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, what, what, so, what's, so what's over 50%? How many, how many do we have? To, no. um, so we have, I believe we have 14, so it would be 8. Um, so for clarification, we do have 19. Um, Chair. Awesome. Oh, go ahead. Uh, 
So you're going to write four names, Council, on, on, on the... Who's going to be for time? Question? No, it's, it's, yeah. uh, How many candidates? Uh, there's, there's six candidates. How many uh, do we vote for? Uh, four, Councilwoman. Four? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, members online, if you could text Stacey your vote, thank you. Mike's the origami pitching. Mine's a little English. Origami buzzer. Ours is the origami crayon. Council, so again, I'll just read the vacancy other solves for candidates report associate desk positions to fill that inspired term of office for three to four years unless we move for cause or by reason of abolition of said office or office vacated due to reservation of death advertisement is from Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021, open until March 17th, 2021. The office of the secretary will receive all applications to try to counsel to make the appointments. So this is what we're voting for council. So there's four associate judge positions.
that came off as excuse. Okay. So then that brings you down to 17. Because you have, you have um, three excuse, and then Sonia recused herself. Craig was off. He's on. Yeah. And he already gave me, I think he's off and on because he already gave me his. So I put here, it was just Ryan. <coughs> Okay, Council, so we're so we're good. So go ahead. So we have uh, we'll just uh for the uh stays home who we have uh Rainer. Seventeen. So we have seventeen members <coughs> present in council, so that would constitute eight for a majority. Um so go ahead, uh Sergeant Marks. Okay. Steve Emery, John Hussman, Richard Littlehawk, Deborah Musso. Steve Emery, Richard Bark, John Hussman, Richard Littlehawk. Richard Littlehawk, Dead Musso, Richard Bark, John Hussman. Steve Emery, Richard Littlehawk, Dead Musso, Lance fills the pipe. Emery, Little Hawk, Bear Runner, fills the pipe. Steve Emery, Richard Bark, Richard Little Hawk, Deborah Musso. Hold up, hold up. Oh. <laughs> right. Shows the pipe. Richard Lohawk, Steve Emery. Steve Emery. Richard Lohawk. There. Lance fills the pipe. Bear Runner, Little Hawk, fills the pipe, Musso. Steve Emery, Richard Dillwalk, John Hussman, Richard Bark, Hussman, Musso, Dillwalk, Bark. Steve Emery, Richard Bark, John Hussman, Richard Hawk. Steve Emery, John Hussman, Walmy Bearer. Richard Bark. Steve Emery. Richard Bark. Doug Musso. Okay. This one only has two. Thank you. 
John Husband, Richard Dillhawk, Barron, Joseph Pike, Bark, Little Hawk, and Costum. For the majority vote, we have um, Richard Littlehawk with 15, Steve Emery with 13, Richard Bart with 10, and John Husband with 9. Seventeen present. Seventeen Okay, council. So, um, so we do have a majority for all candidates, I believe. Um, Secretary, is there a, a resolution? Uh, oh, council member. Chair, I make the motion to approve Richard Wilhelm, Steve Henry, Richard Bart, and John Huston. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Sergeant Norris, and Secretary. I uh, appreciate your, your work on doing that. Uh, Secretary, you make that resolution. Um. Uh, John, you need a second? Okay, there's a second. Awesome, second. Uh, that's good. Sorry, that's good. Council, I need clarification because we have two resolutions. Um, one is for the Kyle Courthouse, and the other one is for the Pine Ridge Courthouse. Uh, Councilman Steele. Chairman, uh, that was a question I posed on the Chief Judge, and he stated that he would do the assignment. So I think if we just did a blanket resolution, just approving all four associate judges and allow our Chief Judge to make those assignments, and I, I think that would be proper. Okay, thank you, Councilman. Uh, is there others? Uh, uh, okay, see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Okay. Uh, so is that the motion? Is that your motion to do that blanket resolution for? Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councilor. Uh, additional questions, Council? Uh, senior, hearing none, uh, Secretary to read that. Resolution of the Ogolo Sioux Tribal Council of the Ogolo Sioux Tribe appointing Richard Bluehawk, Steve Emery, Richard Bart, and John Husman as associate judges of the Ogolo Sioux Tribe Court, Tribal Court. Whereas the Ogolo Sioux Tribe adopted its constitution and bylaws by referendum vote on December 14, 1935, in accordance with Section 16 of the Indian. Reorganization Act of 1934, 25 U.S.C. subsection 523, and under Article 3 of the Ogallo Sioux Tribe Constitution, the Ogallo Sioux Tribal Council is the governing body of the Ogallo Sioux Tribe, and whereas the Ogallo Sioux Tribal Council has exercised its authority under Article 5, Section 1K of the Ogallo Sioux Tribe Constitution to establish a reservation court with courthouses in Pine Ridge and Kyle, whereas the Tribal Council has the power to appoint associate judges to the Ogallo Sioux tri Tribal Court by a vote of two-thirds of those voting at a me meeting of the Tribal Council pursuant to OST Law and Order Code Chapter 1, Section 2.2. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Ogallo Sioux Tribal Council hereby appoint Richard Littlehawk, Stephen Emery, Richard Bark, and John Husband as the associate judges of the Ogallo Sioux Tribe Tribal Court. Be it further resolved that the salary shall be as budgeted for the associate judges position for the for the court house. And be it further resolved that the judge appointed judges appointed by this resolution shall hold office for a period of four years unless sooner removed for cause or by reason of abolishing of said office or if the office is vacated due to the resignation or death pursuant to OST Law and Order Code Chapter 1, Section 2.3, Certification. Chair, does that vote? Does this vote? Um, does that vote have to be a two thirds? That's what it says in this resolution. Oh, it does. I guess that's three two thirds. Uh, Talk to still. Uh, Talk to still together. If, if I believe it's correct, it does state in the code by two thirds vote of the council, and I, then we might have to individually vote every single position. Um, every resolution separately. That was the point I was just gonna point out. It, it does say that the code way. Unless, uh, if I can clarify that for us, or it's one of the secretaries, but I believe that's what it states. Mr. Chair? Uh, Mr. Brunkler? If the code does say two thirds vote, um, <clears throat> it says that each judge shall be appointed by a vote of two thirds of those voting at a meeting of the tribal council. And so if, if you were to run it as one resolution, it would have to pass by two thirds. If you run them separately, each would have to pass by two thirds. 
So uh, by that standard, um, I believe if we do a two terms, uh, Mr. Emery and Mr. Littlehawk would put across that threshold, and we would have to do another vote of the ones that aren't that didn't get that two thirds, um, and so we just have to do the four candidates. But Miss uh, Miss Musa. Uh, Ms. Musso, uh, did you say you withdrew from this, the, the judge? I just want to clarify that. You show, so Ms. Musso withdrew from, from this one. Uh, so that would be, yeah. Uh, So that would leave four candidates, council. So if we want to go on the four and then we'll produce the two thirds, we could we could probably do that. So we would have to do the vote again. Are the ones that is it just the resolution that's what I Okay. Uh, Mr. Gunn, so is so uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, so is that is the is it the resolution that needs to pass by two thirds or is it the the each judge that needs two thirds of vote? It just says each judge shall be appointed by a vote of two thirds of those voting. So I I think if you if you ran a resolution and two thirds of, of those of you voting voted for the judge in the resolution. Um, I, I think that would suffice. It just says, but I wanna be clear and you all can interpret this however you think is right. It says each judge shall be appointed by a vote of two thirds of those voting at a meeting of the tribal council. And, and technically when you, when you vote on a motion or a resolution, that, that is a vote. So if you were to have a resolution appointing judge number one and it passed by two thirds, that would be, that would be a vote of two thirds. I'm at Okay, so we got a couple. So I know uh, Councilwoman Swatter and then Councilwoman Sears. Thank you for that, Mr. Gunn. Now, two of them have made the two thirds vote. Wouldn't we just vote for two more candidates as a two thirds? Uh, Mr. Gunn? Well, um, yes, if you want to run, if you want to run another vote for the two who didn't get two thirds during your vote, you can do that. Um, that's fine. You can, you, you could take the top two, four vote getters and run the resolutions. And if they all got two thirds, when you run it that way, then that would be your decision, but that's really up to you. Um, uh, oh, uh, Yeah, um, I think the way I interpret it is that um, the the selection we made, those were just the, the votes that we took, but to confirm it by resolution, 
I think that would be the two thirds of each one. I'm I'm thinking it's of each, so it's got to be run separately, all four of them. I mean, that's just the way I interpret it. Okay, thank you, Council. Uh, so there's a couple options, Council. So so one of the options, and again, it's it's the interpretation of the two thirds. Uh, <laughs> So the one option is to accept the top two and then do another round between the four and then get in. Uh, the second option is to accept all of the ones who got selected, get that and do those by individual resolution. Is that correct? And if one of those resolutions doesn't get two thirds, then revolt or uh, run one regular resolution with all four names and then getting the two thirds. Um, so I believe that's what's been explained. Chairman. Uh, so Councilman Steele and then and then Councilman Whitehorse. Chairman, it's obvious that uh, Judge Littlehawk and Judge Emery were were, you know, they were obvious, you know, obviously they they, they were they were the vote get the lead vote getters. I think. Um, we should just eliminate them out of the net, the running, and, and like you said, go with the option to do the next four, and then if they if they go past the twelve vote margin, then that meets the two third requirement. Because I don't think it's fair to either Judge Littlehawk or Judge Emery if if council reps vote no against the blanket resolution um, because they don't support other two judges. So I, I think it'll only be fair to just do another runoff. Uh, okay, thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Whitehorse. I think in, to save time, we should just do individual resolutions in the order that they were voted. And if they don't get two thirds, we go to the next one. Do you know what I mean? Because we know that the top two are definitely going to get two thirds because they have enough support. So why don't we just run each individual motion? That way they're done by a resolution individually for each appointment. We do a resolution for Judge Littlehawk and a resolution for Judge Emery and then a resolution for Judge Bark and then a resolution for John Hussman. And if either of the other two, the lower two don't get two thirds, then we go to the next highest and do a resolution for them. That would save time instead of having to do a whole runoff again. Okay, um, so council, so you have multiple options. I'm just waiting for somebody to make a motion. So that's what I'm we have about four options in front of you. So, uh, Councilman Swagger. If it's a motion, I'd like to motion to keep the top two who made the two thirds votes and then rerun the vote for the remaining two to gain a two thirds vote. I'll second your motion. So, that's uh, there's a motion made, second it. Is there any other motions at this time? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilman. So, um, so there's a motion on the floor, Council. Um, so again, uh, can you state your motion more time, uh, Councilman? Thank you, Chair. I'd like to motion that the top two who made the two thirds votes remain, and then we take another vote for the remaining two to gain a two thirds vote. Thank you. And just for the record, I, I want to do a, a roll call vote so we know how many people are actually voting. Um, so, Secretary, if you could just do run the, the roll call. I know we have a quorum, but I just want to make sure. Uh, Chairman, for clarification on the motion, are we doing another vote for the remaining two? Is that your motion? Okay. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Gunn, go ahead. Do I understand the motion maker to mean that it's a runoff with all candidates for the last remaining two slots, with the exception of the two high vote getters? That's correct. 
Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, Subcare, if you want to um, uh, do a vote for the fast. Yeah, yeah just do it. This is to establish quorum. Wesley Hawkins, Sr. Yeah. Blaine Little Thunder. Oh. Cora Whitehorse. Here. Ryan Jumping Eagle. Gerald Canoyer, Jr. Present. Austin Watkins, Sr. Oh. Tyler Yellowboy. Still here. Wendell Youngman, Jr. Me too. Ron Dubray. Oh. James Cross. Here. Ella Giancarlo. George Dreamer, Jr. Present. Julian Spotted Bear. Present. Richard yeah. Aaron Todd is excused. David Puyer. Here. Yeah. Sonia Little Hawk Weston. I believe she recused herself from the voting. Right here. Jackie Sears. Here. Michael Carlos Sr. Present. Bernardo Rodriguez Jr. is excused. Garfield Still. Here. Craig Dillon. You're killing me, Smalls, but I'm here. Okay, Council, so there's 17 here, and then uh, we're going to get the number that we need for two thirds. Uh, so 12 constitutes a two thirds council. So, uh, Sergeant Arms, if you want to um, uh, help with the voting again. Oh, okay. Um, so, if we could run that vote uh, for Councilman Swagger, and uh, we, we'd start there. But this is great. Um, so, uh, Secretary, go ahead and call the roll. Wesley Hopkins, Sr. Here. Wendell Youngman, Jr. Here. Ryan Jumping Eagle, Sr. Gerald Canario Jr. Yes. Austin Watkins Sr. Here. Austin. No. Tyler Yellowboy. Yes. Wendell Youngman Jr. Yes. Ron Dubray. No. James Cross. Yes. Ella Giancarlo. Yes. George Dreamer Jr. Yes. Jillian Spotted Bear. Yes. David Clear. No. Jackie Sears. Yeah. Michael Carlos Sr. Yes. Garfield Steele. Yeah. Craig Dillon. Yes. Chairman, do we select two? Uh, yeah, you pick uh, for the two vacant seats. There's four names. Uh, uh, you can vote up to two. You can vote up to one. It's up to you. But there's four names, and uh, and again, remember, twelve constitutes uh, uh, the needed two thirds. So, can you announce the names, please? Uh, yeah. So. so the people who 
So there's Judge Hussman, there's Judge um, Bart, and then there's Fields of Pipe and Bear on the ground. That's all we needed to know. Don't, don't put Judge Walker. <laughs> Also, so there is some volume music, so. But we gotta keep it light away because we've been here since a lot of so. The sergeant and R is requested to play this music in the background as we hear. So. The secretaries, are you ready? Okay. Uh, so again, remember, uh, so it's the uh, 12, 12 votes uh, constitutes two thirds, and um, so so we'll we'll go from there. So go ahead, uh, Sergeant Arms. Okay. Richard Bark, John Hussman.
Richard Bark, Lance fills the pipe. Fills the pipe, bear running. Richard Bark, John Hussman. John Hussman, Richard Bark. Bear Runner fills the pipe. John Hussman. Richard Bark, Lance fills the pipe. Richard Bark, John Hussman. Hussman, Bark. Bart, Barron, fills the pipe, Barron, Barron, fills the pipe. Fills the pipe. Bear runner. Bark. Usman. Bear runner. Fills the pipe. Fills the pipe, bear runner. Etch it off, that's it. So, Council, so what we can do is uh, eliminate the lowest vote getter, which would be uh, Mr. Husband. And then, is that is that agreeable? So, the, those of you that are listening, uh, the results are Richard Bark nine, John Husman seven, Bear Runner eight, and fills the pipe nine. And none of the candidates met, met the two third threshold. Uh, so do another presentation. So council, so there's uh, so we could do another vote, but we could vote for one and they just have to keep eliminating. That would be the other option. That would be the fairest way. So you just re roll, roll for one, whoever gets that, you know, highest number. And then you got to do another vote for the three candidates. And like that.
So is there any, there's two options here in this case. So we vote for the, you eliminate one or you just do another vote. You probably have two more votes. Okay. Uh, Councilman Carl. Um, I think Sonia's trying to get in and I think she should be allowed to vote since um, Richard isn't in this this round. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you, Councilwoman. She's on. Okay. She's on. Okay. Chairman, what are we doing now? Okay, so what we'll do is that, uh, so we'll do another vote. Uh, you'll pick the, the, you'll pick one name. And uh, we just got to do by elimination. So you're going to have to run at least two votes. So we're voting one? For just for one name, yeah, just for one name. Um, so if you vote for one name, it's going to be you get to that call threshold. And then the next round, you're going to have three candidates, and you're going to just vote one name again, and most likely you'll get to that threshold again. Then your um, quorum goes up to 18. And so 18, um, two thirds is 12. Okay, so we now will have uh, 12. Now 12 is the threshold. And uh, we have 18 members because Sonia's uh, councilwoman, uh, Little Hawk Western Florida. So, so again, council, so this vote for one day. Chair. Mr. Chair, Mr. President. Uh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't know if it would be uh, fair for me to be voting because I didn't listen to none of the interviews on the associate judges. I did recuse myself from, uh, you know, the interviews for the associate judge positions. Um, uh, Richard, get in, uh, that changes your perception of mine. Because there would be no conflict of interest. So you're just waiting for one name, Council. And uh, for the members online and listening public, so we have Mr. Richard Barr. Miss Miss Bur uh, Miss Mr. Phil the Pipe, and uh, Judge Husband. So you're gonna pick one name out of uh, Uh, just for the record, Council, so Councilwoman Little Hawk Weston is recusing herself because she wasn't a part of the interview process, which is fine. Uh, so the quorum is still at 12, though. So you need 12 or two thirds. Okay. If we're doing one vote, I don't think anyone's going to get that, that threshold. I think we should just go with the highest vote getters and carry on. I know, but the resolution can be voted two thirds. But we're not going to get to two thirds voting. So 
So, well, let's just re do the votes and then see what happens. So, and then, then we'll try to figure this out if we don't, if it doesn't work. So. Oh my gosh. That's why we should just do the resolutions in the order of the votes they received. Exactly. All right. Okay. Mark. Husband. Bear runner. Bear runner. Husband. Close the pipe. Park. Park. Bear runner. Close the pipe. Bark. Husband. Baron. Rick Bark. John Husband. Close the pipe. Close the pipe. That's it. Because the results are Richard Bart five, John Huston four, Carolina four, and just the five four. Well, council is still working, so either way you look at it, I don't know that it's gonna work. Um council went white horse, did you have another idea? <laughs> About a half hour ago, Josh, um, do resolutions for each individual candidate. Start with the highest vote getter because those top two already had two thirds. So, you know, they're going to get two thirds. And then with the lower ones, go with the highest vote getters that we had in the first round. Do resolutions for them until we get two more with two thirds vote. Second. Okay, so there is a motion. It's been seconded. Uh, council, do you want to? Uh, uh, is there any discussion on that? Uh, Councilman Seal. You know, <clears throat> when um, even if you ran it the way we did just now with Mr. Littlehawk and um, Mr. Uh, Emery, 
they wouldn't have meant two thirds either because of the way the voting is voting one person and we're selecting four of them. It's obvious here, none of them would get the two thirds and that's what I've stated before. But if um, if you're gonna do this elimination process that Tora's talking about, you know, it, it switched from the top two, obviously when we voted one rather than four. So if you do an open vote, of course we're all gonna vote in favor of a resolution open vote. And I don't think that process is, is um, it's fair to the ones who came in last, but because it showed that the vote obviously changed when you when you change how much we select each election process. So I think we move on, Mr. Rick Bark, to the other two individuals, and then have one more last election with the last two individual, and the highest vote getter will be the fourth one. That's my suggestion. Um, do you want to make that a motion, Councilman? Yeah, there's there's a motion on the. Uh, on the part. Yeah, we got. I mean, so let's just run uh, Councilman Whitehorse's suggestion first, and then, um, you know, if we don't we don't figure that out. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cora, can you um, clarify again for the record, please? Run individual resolutions for each candidate to make sure that they have two thirds vote of the council, starting from the highest vote getters down to the bottom until we have four candidates who have two thirds vote. So it would be individual resolutions per candidate. Wesley Hawkins, Senior. Ooh. Blaine Little Thunder. Oh. For a white horse? Yes. Gerald Kenoyer Jr. Gerald. Austin Hawkins Sr. Tyler Yellowboy. Wendell Youngman Jr. Ron Dubray. Oh. James Cross. Yes. Ella John Carlo. George G. Virginia. Yes. Julian Spotted Bear. No. David Queer. Yeah. Jackie Sears. Uh huh. Michael Carlos Sr. Garfield Still? No. Craig Dillon? Yes.
uh, Council Life House is 96 down one on one with Council. Uh, so by that standard, I think we have a couple of resolutions we need to do. Uh, so, Secretary, you're going to need this first one. Okay, the first, the first one you had was approving Richard Littlehawk and Steve Emery. Do you still need to run the vote on that one? So that's the first resolution would be to. So this will be for Richard Littlehawk. Wesley Hawkins Sr. Oh. Blaine Little Thunder. Oh. Carl Whitehorse. Yes. Gerald Kenoyer Jr. Austin Mockman Sr. Oh. Tyler Yellowboy. Yes. Wendell Youngman Jr. Yes. Ron DeGray. No. Oh. James Cross. Yes. Ella John Carlos. George Zuma Jr. Yes. Yes. Julian Spotted there. Yes. David Puyer. Yeah. Yeah. Jackie Sears. Uh huh. Michael Carlo Sr. Yes. Garfield Still. Yes. Greg Dillon. Yes. Okay, Council. Uh, that passes 15 yes, one no, and one not voting. Thank you. So the second resolution will be for Steve Emery, Wesley Hopkins Sr. Oh. Blaine Little Thunder. Oh. Cora Whitehorse. Yes. Gerald Kanoya Jr. Austin Hopkins Sr. Oh. Tyler Yellowboy. Yes. Lyndall Youngman Jr. Yes. Rhonda Gray. Oh. James Cross. Yes. George Dreamer Jr. Yes. Jillian Splatted Bear? Yes. David Puyo? Yes. Jackie Sears? Uh huh. Michael Carlos Sr.? Yes. Yeah. Garfield Steele? Yes. Yeah. Greg yeah. Dillon? Yeah. Uh, council that passed unanimous, thank you, Council. Um, Secretary, if you want to read the uh, next one. Okay, so the next resolution. Okay. 
Yeah, uh, so the next one uh, from that original vote was Richard Bart. So is there a motion to accept? A uh, motion by Councilman Fleer. Is there a second? Second by Councilman Watkins. And remember, this is a two thirds council, so it needs. Uh, Uh, so 11 votes are needed council on this one. So that's two thirds. Uh, Secretary Wesley Hopkins, senior. Oh. Blaine Little Thunder. Oh. Jeremy Whitehorse. Yes. Gerald Kenoyer, Jr. Yes. Austin Watkins, Sr. Yes. Tyler Yellowboy. Wendell Youngman, Jr. Yes. Rhonda Gray. Oh. James Cross. Yes. George Streamer, Jr. Yes. Julian Spotted Bear. Yes. David Clear. Jackie Sears. Uh huh. Michael Carlo Sr. Yes. Garfield Still. No. Craig Dillon. Yes. Okay, Council, that motion passes 14 yes, one no, and we're not voting. Thank you, Council. And for the uh, last thing, it votes. Mr. John Huston with Long Book. Um, is there a, a motion to accept Mr. Huston? Motion. Uh, okay, motion by uh, Councilman Watkins and second by Councilman Debray and Councilman. Hopkins and Councilman and Sears. Uh, so to put it on the board, Wesley Hopkins, Sr. Oh. Blaine Little Thunder. Oh. For a white horse. No. Gerald Kenoyer, Jr. No. Austin Watkins, Sr. No. Tyler Yellowboy. No. Wendell Youngman, Jr. Yes. Ron DeBray. No. James Cross. No. George Dreamer Jr. No. Julian Swatterberg? No. David Clear? No. Jackie Sears? Uh huh. Michael Carlin Sr. Yes. Garfield Still? No. Craig Dillon? Yes. Okay, thank you, uh, Council. So that motion fails uh, to receive the necessary two thirds, uh, nine yes, seven no, and uh, one not voting, Council. Oh, zero not voting. So nine yes, seven no. So that fails to receive the uh, required two thirds. Um, so, uh, so we have three. Uh, so, do we just do a runoff between the two, or or? Uh, oh. Oh, go ahead, Councilman I'll, make, I'll make a motion to approve the resolution appointing Lance Bills Pipe. 
Okay. Um, um, for clarification, uh, in that original vote, uh, Ms. Bearrunner received more votes, uh, seven to six. Okay, then I'll change my motion to um, approve her appointment. Okay. Uh, so there's a motion to uh, for Ms. Bearrunner because your husband is well to receive the two thirds necessary. The queen, the queen was his, uh, second. Uh, who was the second? Uh, Councilman Steele. Okay. Wesley Hopkins, Sr. Oh. Lane Little Thunder. Oh. Clara Whitehorse. Yes. Gerald Camillo, Jr. Oh. Austin Watkins, Sr. Oh. Taylor Yellowboy. Yes. Lindell Youngman, Jr. Yes. Rhonda Gray. Yeah. James Cross? Yes. George Jr. Jr.? Yes. Julian Spottedbeck? Yes. <coughs> David Clear? Yeah. Jackie Sears? Uh huh. Michael Carlos Sr.? Yes. Garfield Still? Yep. Craig Dillon? Yes. Uh, Council, so Ms. Uh, Ms. Bairman agrees we could judge all the 15 yes uh, votes and one no vote. So that, that would be the board. Um, so, so we can move on to the resolution now. Yeah, uh, Councilman Steele. I, I got a 14 to 4 and 2 agreements. All right, uh, so. um, Mr. DeBray was the only one that got a no. Uh, Council, besides Mr. DeBray. Oh, uh, Councilman DeBay, uh, is there any other notes? Oh, Councilman Watkins, no. So it goes, okay, so it would be the Okay, so for the record, it was, it was 14, four, and two of those. So thank you for that, appreciate it. But it does meet the two thirds, so, so that would be those two. So thank you. Uh, so, uh, so okay, if you want to run the resolution now with the four names, and you could get the Okay, Council Steele. Yeah. Okay, okay, no okay, all right, my fault. Okay, so we'll, so we'll do that resolution now. Okay, good. Okay, so we have the prosecutors now. Chairman uh, Watkins. Um, but that's all right with the bill calls for the two bills and that get going. And that they'll be swearing in tomorrow. They'll swear to good with them tomorrow. Yeah, that, that's all right. So we could, we could do those tomorrow. Dedication to your people, boys. Um, council, so there's there's four positions and there's only four applicants. Uh, we got, um, I think, uh, well, there's three now. Yeah, there's, there's three actually. There's, Yeah, so there's where so there's uh, I believe it's uh, Miss Deborah Musso, Miss Kilbride, and Lance Gilsenpipe. 
Those are the three. Council. Yeah. And there's four positions. So there's a motion to point all three, second by Councilman Youngman. Mr. Chair. Uh, go ahead. Uh, is this for the prosecutors? Yeah. Uh, we're not interviewing, this is where right? Is there uh, going to be interviews? Are they, is this making a motion to put them in? Uh, they're making a motion to put them in, Councilwoman. Okay, okay. I just want to be uh, considered to vote on this one. Okay. On the right. prosecutors. Okay, good deal. Um, so there's a motion to appoint all three because there's four positions. Uh, second by Councilman Youngman. Any discussion on that, Councilman? Um, Chairman. Uh, go ahead. I guess uh, clarification. You just selected Ms. Barron as a judge, so then they're going to speak. Oh, right. Okay, never mind. My mistake, but yeah, I'll make that motion. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Watkins? Uh, is that a second or? Uh, okay, so, so it's happened by Councilman Youngman and Councilman Watkins. So, point. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chair. Um, go ahead, Mr. Dunn. Um, you did, you did. I just wanted to make sure that we're in agreement that there are three positions that are open. Um, um, there's really four positions that are open and there's three candidates. Well, um, it was my understanding when the council passed its resolution on March, um, I think it was March 3rd that they they asked the secretary to advertise the positions that were held by Lance fills the pipe, Vernona kills right, and Wamdi Omni Bear Runner, but that there was a there was a fourth position, which um, which is held by Deborah Musso, and she was appointed in 2019. And so I don't think that her position is expiring. And the resolution that the council passed indicated that she has more than one year left on her appointment. If you want, if, if she's one of the applicants and you want to just simply reappoint her now for a new three years, I, I suppose that wouldn't be a problem, but she technically still has time left on her term. Mr. Gunn. Yes. Is, um, so I would reword the motion as to select the three individuals excluding Ms. Musso and then reappointing her after this motion is granted. Yeah, there were three positions that were advertised and that were open. So if you appoint three to fill those three positions and and then you could you could run a motion to appoint her. I suppose it doesn't do any harm, but her position just technically is not expiring yet. Isn't Debbie one of the applicants? I thought that she was. Yeah, she is. So I guess my motion, my amended motion would be to appoint Ms. Verona kills right. Mr. Lance Moose Lance uh, fills pipe, and and Ms. Musso. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, and so to advertise for the other position. And re advertise for the other position. Is that is that where? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, so we'll so we'll run that. Um, we'll run that, and then uh, uh, so if we want to, is there any discussion? Yeah. Any discussion at this time? So the secretary's going to read it, uh, resolution, and uh, we'll just uh, proceed from there. Thank you. Resolution of the Avalon City Charter Council of the Avalon City Charter appointing Renona Gilsry, Lance Vilsapipe, and Deborah Musso to serve as tribal prosecutors under the supervision of the Tribal Attorney General for a term of three years. Whereas the Avalon City Charter adopted its constitution and bylaws by referendum vote on December 14, 1935 in accordance with Section 16 of the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, 25 U.S.C. subsection 5123, and under Article 3 of the Oglala Sioux Tribal Constitution, the Oglala Sioux Tribal Constitution is the governing body of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. And whereas the Oglala Sioux Tribal Council has exercised its authority under Article 5, subsection 1K, of the Oklahoma Sioux Tribe Constitution to establish a reservation court in court houses in Penridge and Tile. And whereas the Oklahoma Sioux Tribal Council has established four tribal prosecutor positions to prosecute criminal offenses in the Penridge and Tile court houses. And whereas the four tribal prosecutor positions are filled by the Oklahoma Sioux Tribal Council under terms and conditions set forth in tribal law, including chapter one, section nine of the Oval Sioux Tribal Law and Code. And having, whereas having advertised the positions and having considered the applications of all qualified candidates, the Oval Sioux Tribal Council in Nexus resolution to fill the positions. Now therefore be it resolved that the Oval Sioux Tribal Council of the Oval Sioux Tribe hereby appoint for normal field to write on schools of pipe and the Romusso to serve as tribal prosecutors for the Oglala Sioux Tribe under the supervision of the Tribal Attorney General for a term of three years with salaries to be uh, budgeted by the Oglala Sioux Tribe Tribal Council on a year to year basis. Certification. Uh, discussion, Council. Um, hearing or seeing none. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, oh, Mr. I, I think that you would just have a, a another be it resolved clause um, that would just say um, um, that the, the council authorizes and directs the tribal secretary to advertise um, the fourth tribal prosecutor position and to bring all qualified applicants to the tribal council. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so we go. Uh, anything else, Council? Um, hearing or seeing none, uh, Secretary Gibbons. Wesley Hawkins. Oh. Wayne Little Thunder. Oh. Laura Whitehorse. Yes. Gerald yes. Jr., Austin Watkins Sr., Tyler Yellowboy. Yes. Wendell Young Jr. Yes. Rhonda Bray. Oh. James Cross. Yes. George Dreamer Jr. Yes. Dillian Spider Bear. David Puyer. Yes. Sonia Little Hawk Weston. Ha. Jackie Sears. Oh, uh huh. Michael Carlos Sr. 
Yes. Mark is good. Marshall? Yeah. Yep. Okay, Council, so that motion passes 17 for uh, zero against. Thank you, Council. Um, thank you to the prosecutors. Uh, you're, you're back in. Um, so you don't have to answer any questions. Um, Council, so that leaves us with the um, we have some two third items. So what are we going to do with, do with those, Council? Council? Uh, we have two third items that we want to do. What are we going to do? Those council motion to recess until tomorrow. Motion to recess until tomorrow. Okay, Chairman. If we just read the resolution, then go. I think we can knock this off in 15 minutes. Uh, I Um, I know that Miss Cummings wanted the executive session still, and she's still here if you want to do that. But we'd have to, we can go into executive. Uh, is it going to take very long? You think the count? Uh, well, it didn't take too long. Okay. So, uh, Council Skill. We also have another individual that's here on the issue all day long waiting, and we have that issue on the agenda also. Um, yeah, what, what was that, Councilman Skill? Um, Ms. Doris Speckman. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. okay. Um, so let's, uh, which one was, uh, Ms. Respect something? Oh, let me see, okay. Um, are we going to do that one, Executive 2, or just? I, I don't think we need it on an Executive, it's a resolution. Okay. Um, so let's do uh, Lisa's really quick. So we go through the team vote, and then we'll then we'll go to uh, Doris's. That's okay, Council. Okay, so we need a motion for Executive Council. Uh, motion by Councilman Fears and second. Second by your second, second by Councilman Watkins. So it's one executive. Motion is for executive session. Wesley Hawkins, Sr. Blaine Little Thunder. Oh. Fire White Horse. Yes. Gerald Canario, Jr. Yes. Austin Watkins, Sr. Henry Yellow Boy. Wendell Youngman Jr. Ron Gibray. Oh. James Pass. Yes. George Dreamer Jr. Yes. Julian Spotted Bear. David Clear. Yeah. Sonia Rohan Weston. Ah. Jackie Sears. Yeah. Michael Carlos Sr. Yeah. Garfield Skill. Craig Gillen. Yep. Thank you. 
right, tell us why it passes 14 yes, uh, one no, or two not voting for the council. Oh, and uh, Councilman uh, Hawkins will discuss that too. Um, so, Miss. Uh, So, Council, one time I was in the state legislature, we had a motel about one in the morning. So, uh, 